Hello, everyone who's listening out there on Facebook. This is Dan Weatherspoon. I'm the host of the Mormon Matters podcast. I'm with my good friend and a longtime conversation partner, John DeLynn. Welcome, John. You're the host of Mormon Stories. And I'm the host of the Mormon Matters uh, it's, good to, it's good to see you, Dan. It's good to be here. Thanks for making this happen. I'm excited. You, you bet. I'm glad that we're going to be co-releasing this uh, podcast together uh, through both of us, and we're looking forward to having some online participation from those who's tu- who are tuning in. We are really excited today to talk about a topic that in some ways has, is very controversial and it, it, it has like this nasty taste in its mouth. Uh, and it's the term apologetics or it's the act of defending the faith. And it's so often um, maligned and people say, oh, no, I'm not an apologist and you know, I'm avoiding that label. Others embrace it. But for the most part, it's sort of become... A pejorative term in many ways for many people. And I think the main reason for that is that for so many, it's like apologetics is only done when you already know the answer and no matter what, you're going to work your way to get that answer, you know, justified or, you know, shored up or something like that. And it doesn't feel like an open-ended discussion, but there's much more to it than just that. And so we're going to talk today about the role of apologetics within Mormonism, the history of it a little bit, but then mostly uh, with John leading that part of the discussion later, we're going to talk about apologetics and the way it's being done today. So along with John and I, we have uh, Brian Birch with us, who's uh, the, the head of the Center for the Study of Ethics at Utah Valley University. He's a fellow Claremonter with me, a couple (laughs) years behind me there at at Claremont, and uh, we got to know each other there, and we've been great friends and even a little golfing partner since. So, Brian, welcome. Thanks for having me, Dan. And Patrick Mason, welcome as well. You are the Claremont uh, Howard W. Hunter Chair of Mormon Studies, and how many years now? Three, four? Six. Oh my heck, man! Brother. Yeah, time flies. <laughs> yeah, and you're even the head of the uh, whole school of religion right now. The uh, well, I'm the dean of the school of arts and humanities. Now. Oh, arts and humanities, which includes yeah. religion and things. So, right. man, busy guy. Thanks for taking some time with us. No, thrilled to be here. Thanks. We, we caught you on your last day of a trip to Utah, so we're yeah. glad we were able to do that. So, um, John and I quickly, um, let's just, John. Uh, you have an, an event to announce. I have a quick event to announce. I probably should have done this before I introduced everybody. I just wanted to remind everybody who's interested. A week from Friday, we begin a Mormon Matters retreat, which is the 13th through the 15th. It's in Salt Lake City on the east side. It's really easy to get to. It's just a wonderful gathering of a, a bunch of people who are going to wrestle with uh, our faith and our our you know engagement within Mormonism and things like that. It's, it's kind of geared towards those who are trying to make Mormonism work, but are occasionally um, a little frustrated or feel like they're left out or they're not quite sure how to engage and and share their selves authentically. So uh, Natasha Parker and I, along with Jana Spangler, are going to be leading that. And there's lots of information at mormonmatters.org. And please sign up. Thanks. John, you have one at least coming up this month too as well. Yeah, yeah. We're having a one-day workshop called Rebuilding Your Life After a Mormon Faith Crisis. It's going to be in... uh, Utah County, Salt Lake City area, Um, and it's going to be an all-day thing, and we're really excited about it. Go to mormonstories.org slash events um, to register and to find out more information about it, and then I'll just say that uh, Open Stories Foundation is looking for a web designer, so if there's anyone out there who knows WordPress, uh, WordPress templates, WordPress, WordPress frameworks, we are looking for a designer. Great. Super. Good. And um, all right. So I'm back to the real thing here. So, uh, Brian, I'm going to throw to you first. Patrick, jump in at any times. We're going to kind of more focus uh, in the second half on, uh, you know, your kind of work and some of your colleagues and and what you guys are doing within Mormonism uh, a little bit later. But Brian, you wrote uh, an essay. It's a wonderful essay kind of overviewing the history of Mormon apologetics. It's in a new volume from uh, Greg Coford Books called Perspectives in Mormon Theology, Apologetics. I think you're one of the co-editors of the series. Am I right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and this particular volume was Blair Van Dyke and Lloyd Erickson, who were the editors. But your essay sort of served uh, as an overview of things within Mormonism. Uh, Some of the earlier essays, though, uh, 
at least kind of framed more broadly the field of apologetics and what the terms mean and things like that. Do you recall that or do you want me to lead out in this section about, you know, what's, where, what's the origin of the term? You know, it sounds like you're apologizing, but it's certainly yeah. not that. So, Yeah, I'm happy to give a little bit of background. Uh, just generally speaking, uh, apologetics uh, is, uh, goes way back to classical times, right? We have the famous uh, apology of Plato. Uh, connected to the trial of Socrates. So the word itself comes from uh, the Greek word uh, uh, apologos, uh, which essentially means uh, uh, speech in defense of oneself. And the term was taken up into uh, Christian thought as Christianity began to expand from Palestine to the broader Roman world. As, uh, as converts joined, some of them were very well-educated and sought to reconcile central Christian teaching with the learning of the day. And in the second century, for example, uh, you have a number of thinkers who were writing texts that were attempting to reconcile Christian theology with uh, Platonic philosophy, uh, with Stoic thought. Uh, there are a number of different ways in which uh, early Christian scholars were attempting to uh, defend Christianity uh, against uh, criticisms that were coming from a variety of directions, uh, uh, depending on the, the schools of thought of the day. Yeah. So it has a very early origin, yeah. and uh, it's continued on in various forms since. Cool. And within your, by framing it there, you were saying that apologetics were doing, was doing two things. In some degree, they were responding to critics. In other ways, they were doing reconciling. They were trying to make it as the most robust version they could, given the understandings of their day and things like that. And so there are these right. sort of, these two strains of ap apologetics that the volume uh, talks about too. Do you want to quickly go into those? Yeah, just in broad terms, uh, one of the key distinctions is that between what is called positive apologetics and negative apologetics, right. where po positive apologetics seeks to establish uh, one truth or other uh, of Christian thought uh, through the use of reason and uh, empirical observation, science and the like, uh, where negative apologetics uh, is more modest in its attempt to deflect or diffuse criticisms of Christianity. Right. And, uh, and they've been employed in various ways and in you know, different times in Christian history. But even in the earliest efforts by Justin Martyr in Tertullian, you know, some of the early apologists uh, uh, believed that uh, Plato was an unbaptized Christian because his thought, uh, in their eyes, mm -hmm. uh, was so closely connected to the, the teachings of the New Testament. Uh, others were less ambitious and optimistic <laughs> and merely attempted to uh, parry and, uh, yeah. and respond to criticisms that were leveled by uh, by the thinkers of the day. Cool. Patrick, is there anything on this broader background of the terms, the two type apologetics that occur to you at this point to, to speak up to before we kind of move into the Mormon versions of this? No, I, I think that's a great overview. And, and uh, so I'll, I will continue to defer to my colleague, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. awesome. I was hoping well, I could defer to you. <laughs> Dan, one thing I might add is, you know, just, I mean, I started with early Christianity, and that's a fun period with the early church fathers. But one thing that needs to be mentioned, I think, before we jump into the Mormon context is just how, how apologetics is done within, you know, Christian theology and philosophy today. And, you know, there's been a very active tradition in Protestant thought and more particularly within evangelical Christian thought uh, where, you know, there's a, a, a very well-defined uh, conversation that's been going on for a, a few centuries uh, regarding how best to connect, you know, faith and reason, Christian thought with science and, uh, and it's been a it's been a fascinating journey for Protestant thought, and there's some really really interesting connections between what's happening in that conversation and yeah. what we see at least beginning to happen within a Mormon context. So, 
I Good. think that'd be a fun thing to explore a little bit if we have some time. Yeah, no, I hope, well, and, I hope we will. Well, and I jump in and say, yeah, so it's been very robust in Protestant context, but also in, in Catholic circles as well. I mean, one of the most famous modern pieces of apologetics was John Henry Newman's apology of when he, right. uh, he, he was a famous Anglican prelate who converted to Catholicism. And so he, he wrote this uh, extensive uh, apologia for uh, essentially explaining why he decided to, to convert and join the, the Roman Catholic Church. So it's it's a robust tradition in various strains of Christianity. Right. Yeah, yeah, interesting. Hey, uh, Patrick, while I got you right there, there's a light shining like right on your lips. So I don't know if you want to just adjust something. It I think is, that's a metaphor, Dan. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. That's right. Uh, the, the, the light is coming from you. Anyway, thanks, right. brother. All right, uh, is that better? Yeah, thanks. Okay. Now, John, you're monitoring the online stuff. Is there anything that's happening there that you wanted to bring in, or is there anything at this sort of basic level? Just, of just, Mer just, just one commenter wrote, thanks for the distinction between positive and ne negative apologetics. I, I got the definition of negative. Will someone just repeat the definition of positive apologetics one more time? Brian, do you mind doing that? Oh, in broad terms, it's, it's, it's the effort to prove or establish the truth of one tenant or another of the faith uh, based upon a rational argument or some kind of empirical argument. Yeah. Okay. Versus trying to deflect or diffuse criticism. Yeah. Which yeah. Is yeah. Okay. Yeah. Right. Got it. And, and to me, you can even go broader than that. I mean, Brian, Brian's sticking with the technical term, but it's really in some ways you could say you're doing at least a form of positive apologetics if you're just trying to present the most robust version of your theology, the most robust version of your, um, your, your, your tradition and all of its richness and depth and things like that. And there's generally a reason when you're doing that is you're saying right now we're, you know, we're, we're concentrating on this lesser aspects or we kind of lost the forest from the trees. And I don't know, do Patrick and Brian, do you sort of agree that that's okay for, for to call that positive apologetics what I'm talking about? Or yeah, is that I mean, the, the waters. The, the, the term is applied different ways, uh, you know, and in a broad context, you can say that, you know, efforts to create a kind of metaphysical foundation for Mormonism or for Christianity is a form of a positive apologetic. And yeah. those efforts have been going on for quite a long time. Right, right. Too. Yeah. Great. Um, okay. So thanks, John. If there's nothing more, let's, let's, no, let's keep on. going. Let's keep okay, going. Let's go to Mormonism. If you guys are ready for that, Brian, you did a wonderful essay that kind of took us through some of the highlight moments. And uh, I just would love to have you a little talk about the various periods of apologetic efforts and uh, where we've landed today, especially in the last few years with big changes at the Maxwell Institute. Yeah, well, it's, it's hard to know exactly where to begin the story. I mean, obviously, there were efforts uh, from very early in the tradition to uh, defend the faith. And some of the practices within the 19th century context included these, these public debates, uh, which uh, uh, Mormon leaders and scholars would, would engage in with other uh, particularly Protestant groups. I don't know of any with, with Catholics in particular in the earliest decades, uh, but uh, there was a, a robust debate culture, mm -hmm. and uh, there were efforts uh, to, uh, to prove theologically, right, the truths of the restoration uh, using the, the traditional tools of, of argumentation and debate. So you had that. And it was a great, period. great time of pamphlet pamphleteering or whatever you would call it and all that yes. stuff too. So these debates would often yes. end in print. The tract, was, yeah, uh, the tract was very popular at the time, right? But there's also this other strand in Mormonism, which uh, has been, you know, very cautious. Uh, Mormonism grew up in a very uh, anti-theological context, right? That's part of the American reaction against uh, European Christianity in some respects is, is the ways in which it felt that Christianity had depended too strongly on uh, theology and that there needed to be more emphasis on the experiential uh, and uh, obviously within a Protestant context, you know, return to the Bible and the text of the Bible. And so Mormonism in a way kind of uh, amplified that anti-theological sentiment and uh, through appeal to, you know, revelation. Yeah. And, and all the implications that were there. So you had kind of two interesting dynamics 
in early Mormonism, right, the attempt to engage in, right, debate and proof, yet on the other hand, uh, uh, a cautiousness with regard to what reason yeah, could can establish. Do. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and and that, though, though, that, that debate's right there in the pages of the book, the volume with the various essays. We have some folks that are saying, man, this is a lost cause when you're talking about what the power and the strength of religion. What are you asking these kinds of questions for? And yeah. That kind of stuff. So uh, I think that theme will come um, up throughout the rest of our conversation today. Yeah. So uh, besides this early period, and Patrick, jump in at any time, of course, and John, but uh, Let's move on from the Pratt brothers and the various pamphleteering and these public debates and things like this to, to a little bit more of a, you know, maybe moves into the 20th century. Uh, right. Well, uh, one way to start that conversation is to talk about Hugh Nibley. Hey, uh, well, Brian, would it be worth just doing a really brief treatment of B.H. Roberts? Was, okay. was his early work trying to be an apologist for the Book of Mormon? And then can you give just a really brief history of how that ended up for him yeah. and, and the quorum? Patrick, do you want it? I mean, I'm happy to defer to Patrick. Uh, go, go for it, Brian. I'll jump in if I need to. Yeah. Well, B.H. Roberts' work was you know, very, I mean, it, it, it was very, very broad. And, you know, it doesn't fall specifically within, uh, you know, a, a self-conscious uh, apologetic. But part of what he was trying to do was to... Uh, was to establish the basic tenets of Mormonism uh, in a quasi systematic way, right? Where he was going through each of the, the central theological features and, and wanting to uh, connect Mormonism to the broader Christian tradition, connect it to scientific traditions. And uh, in some respects, uh, he went much further than, than previous uh, scholars had gone in, in probing uh, in a very broad way, uh, you know, the, the core concepts of, of Mormonism. And uh, at times, uh, his, his research and findings and probings, you know, took him into areas that uh, made uh, uh, his colleagues uh, in the uh, quorums uh, unsettled, right? And there were two areas that are interesting, I think, for our purposes. One is, you know, his interest in Book of Mormon scholarship, and the fact of his journey into establishing or attempting to, to uh, explore the historicity of the Book of Mormon took him to a place where he became more agnostic uh, about the, the historicity of the Book of Mormon than he had even anticipated he might be when he first entered the, that conversation, right? And so that was one. The other one, of course, was uh, the legendary... Uh, debate with Joseph Fielding Smith uh, on uh, reconciling uh, science uh, and scriptural truth, uh, specifically uh, the implications for evolutionary thought and, uh, and what that might mean in terms of how we understand the creation narratives. And uh, so I think Roberts, uh, I mean, he's an example of a lot of different strands within Mormon thought uh, that you know, in terms of apologetics, uh, I think he's a case study in uh, the kinds of sensitivities and tension points that are characteristic of the tradition as a whole. And I Is think it, he's... Go ahead, Patrick. I was going to say, I think he's a great example, too, of what Brian was just talking about of the, uh, in the 19th century this uh, skepticism about formal trained theology. I mean, Roberts was not yeah. a trained theologian. He was self-taught. And, 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 but he was one of the most prolific Mormon authors ever, uh, really. And so it, it shows on, on one level the, uh, the power of the quote-unquote untrained mind, right? That anybody can delve into these topics. Uh, you don't have to have a PhD to do a very rigorous and intelligent analysis of religion and history and all these kinds of things. Uh, but, but he also displayed, as Brian said, a kind of breadth and, and breadth and, and ranged over all kinds of materials uh, simply because he was, he, was, he was just a naturally curious and intelligent person. So in a lot of ways, I think Roberts is the culmination of the, the two kinds of strands that Brian was talking about in, in the 19th century and then also anticipated some of the debates we're still having today in the 21st century. 
Yeah, well said. For the, thank you, Patrick. For those who want to sort of summarize his later work by saying that B.H. Roberts either had significant doubts about the historicity of Book of Mormon or maybe even lost belief in the history of the Book of Mormon, do you guys have a conclusion around that or is that just pure speculation or do you even have an instinct in that regard? Well, I mean, his public statements uh, display uh, much more reticence uh, than, you know, earlier statements. So I think there, you know, there was some movement on his part and he was conscientious about that movement. Uh, but uh, in terms of uh, a kind of uh, disavowal or deep level of skepticism, uh, he didn't go that far as far as I know. Yeah, it certainly didn't undermine his uh, overall faith in the Mormon project uh, or, or the Mormon system. He, would, you know, he continued to reconcile that. But I, I think Brian's comment earlier that he clearly became more agnostic, if not entirely agnostic, about the historicity of the Book of Mormon is is uh, certainly warranted. I mean, he, he just uh, he, he didn't end up where he started. Uh, yeah. with, with, with his research. And that was as much a surprise to him as, as to anybody. And, and it did create uh, internal conflicts within uh, the church leadership who just uh, couldn't follow where he was going and, and were even concerned about uh, some of his publications and, and some of his writings, some of his most important writings weren't uh, published right away. Yeah, and, but he was cautious in his language. You know, yeah. he, uh, people speculate and try to read into you know, what he said and, 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 you know, want to, uh, you know, want to characterize it as he couldn't say all he wanted to say, but he said enough to gesture in the direction of, of skepticism. I think that's still something that, that people can debate. Got it. Yeah. And there, there's a, a book called B.H. Roberts Studies of the Book of Mormon. I know when I worked at Benchmark Books, it was available there. Um, do either of you guys know if it's still easily able to be found? I don't, I don't know. know. I'm sure you can find it online yeah. somewhere. Yeah. Might yeah. be on, on Google. So check that out. And I know that uh, B. H., uh, Truman Madsen's look at B.H. Roberts, he concluded that he didn't think he lost faith in the Book of Mormon, at least especially the spiritual power. But, you know, in some ways, Roberts' own journey with the Book of Mormon, you know, anticipated that of Thomas Stewart Ferguson and a few others. Um, do you want to quickly, before you quite get into Nibley, talk about that period of Book of Mormon uh, wrestling in terms of proving it geographically and, you know, and how that switch ended up moving more towards linguistically and all the other different... The yeah, different I mean, I can defer to Patrick. I've been doing a lot of talking. I'm sure he can do as, as well as I could. Well, sure. I mean, I'll, I'll talk about it briefly because I, I know we want to also move to the late 20th century, but, but there was, uh, it, as the 20th century... Uh, came about, you, you began to see uh, people wanting to provide positive proofs uh, for the Book of Mormon. And I think it's important to recognize the context of this as well, that this is the early 20th century is a period of real debate within American Christianity and, and in fact, Euro-American Christianity about the foundations of the faith. This 1925 is the famous Scopes Monkey trial, so the debate over, over creation uh, accounts in Genesis versus Darwinian evolution. Uh, and, and you have the rise of the fundamentalists uh, within Protestant circles who want to provide uh, rational proofs for what they see as the core claims of Christianity. So, so when Mormons are doing these kinds of things, they're perfectly in concert with the spirit of the times. And there is a debate between what we see as more conservative or even fundamentalist forms of Christianity, and this plays out in Catholicism as well, and also more liberal or modernist versions as well. So, so Mormons certainly want to provide rationalist uh, and tangible proofs uh, for their faith. Uh, most Mormons uh, believe strongly that the Book of Mormon uh, was a history. Uh, historical document. And so they thought, well, if, if uh, there was a burgeoning uh, science of biblical archaeology at the time, so they said, you know, uh, we should be able to do the same thing with the Book of Mormon as well. And so we said, you know, there started to be these expeditions down in uh, Central and South America, uh, you know, to, to go find these lost ruins and temples and, and so forth. And, and people started to, to make claims 
uh, about the archaeological evidence is, uh, for, for the Book of Mormon. Uh, some of these uh, some some of these efforts were discredited at the time. Others have have you know people have been skeptical uh, as this time's gone on. I, I think it's fair to say that none of these uh, archaeological expeditions uh, clinched the argument uh, for, for the for the people who wanted to pro provide positive proofs uh, for the Book of Mormon. In fact, some of them uh, were uh, you know came back. And, and sort of were forced to admit, uh, or, or others uh, uh, forced them to admit that they weren't able to find what, what they had set out to find. Other, others were actually quite bold in their claims and, and thought that they had, had found proofs. And, and there were a lot of uh, publications that came out of that. It influenced scholarship even today. We, we see some revised versions of this in, in uh, people like John Sorensen and others who, who want to talk about the geography of the Book of Mormon and, and mm -hmm. correlate the internal textual evidence of the Book of Mormon with what they see in uh, uh, especially Central American ruins and geography and things like that. So, so we see all of that coming out of a, of, of a period in the early 20th century. Great. Yeah, let's move on from the Book of Mormon at this time, just because I know we, we have a hard stop in about an hour from now. Uh, but anyway, I'm sure that we'd be happy to engage anybody who wants to a little bit more on any of this stuff. But uh, Brian, it seemed like you wanted to take us into the Hugh Nibley, you know, period of this star apologist and polymath or whatever and his influence. Well, I mean, Hugh Nibley's career really... Uh, is expressive of, you know, the development of what you could call modern Mormon apologetics. Uh, I mean, not only, you know, the content of his scholarship, but who, who Hugh Nibley was, what he represented, how he was utilized, how he was mimicked. I mean, he's just a, a hugely influential figure in the development of this, this enterprise. Uh, you know, so Nibley had a 40 plus year career at BYU uh, trained uh, in ancient languages and cultures and uh, just uh, became the go-to person uh, for questions having to do with, uh, you know, the, uh, the ancient uh, American context for the Book of Mormon or the ancient American setting for the Book of Mormon, that to, to draw from the title of Sorensen's book, but also, and most especially Near Eastern, uh, cultures and languages, right? Nibley was interested uh, in the early Christian period and uh, believed that he could uh, find uh, evidences and truths uh, that uh, support Mormon restorationist claims that were uh, unknown to Joseph Smith at the time. And that, that's a, a characteristic apologetic argument is that uh, we're finding things in the ancient world, whether linguistically or archaeologically uh, that, or textually that uh, could not have been known to Joseph Smith. And these parallels uh, represent uh, evidence of the revelatory character uh, of the faith. And that was Nibley's uh, MO in some respects uh, in terms of many of his writings. And so, I mean, he was a wide ranging scholar uh, uh, he wasn't a systematic thinker, right? And so he was uh, famous for these kinds of shotgun blasts <laughs> uh, in terms of, of things he was excited about and working on. And, uh, you know, his scholarship, you know, since, uh, you know, since his retirement and death has come under increasing scrutiny. But in terms of his influence and uh, what he represented to the Mormon scholarly community, it just can't be overstated because Nibley uh, uh, laid the groundwork for what I called in, the, in my essay a, a second generation of, of 20th century apologists that adopted, not on, that followed up on not only the, uh, you know, the content of his scholarship, but also adopted his style yeah. <laughs> and manner of engaging uh, with critics of Mormonism. And I think that's become one of the flashpoints is that Nibley uh, was not afraid to mix it up <laughs> uh, with critics and uh, uh, was occasionally, if not frequently, uh, engaging in, in, in uh, swordplay, right? Intellectual swordplay uh, with his critics. And uh, the, the, the snarkiness of the tone, the, the kind of belittling language that you saw uh, in Nibley's work from time to time, 
uh, was uh, adopted and in some respects amplified by this uh, the second generation of Mormon thought. And that's going back to your very first comments, Dan, right? The, right, the, uh, the negative connection between, apolog right, between apologetics and, and scholarship in Mormon circles, I think, is, is uh, grounded in some respects in uh, the manner of engagement of the, you know, beginning in the mid 20th century and, and starting with Nibley's work, you know, between Mormon apologists and, and their critics. And the, I think there's a sense in which it can be said that, you know, some Mormon apologists, you know, haven't been able to really see any other way or see any other fruitful way of engaging with critics rather than through this, this kind of uh, assertive, uh, at times acerbic yeah. uh, manner. If and I could, could, if, yeah, oh, please. go ahead, Patrick. Go ahead. No, John, Patrick. No, John, Patrick. please. Well, okay. I, Patrick, you go, then I'll give a, a just a different slight commentary. Okay, great. Well, I, I'd say that the one other thing I'd want to say about uh, Nibley, and in a lot of ways, the, the way that uh, I appreciate him most, is that oftentimes his critiques were uh, were targeted internally uh, with, within mm -hmm. the church. And he has uh, a terrific... Uh, and also assertive and acerbic critiques <laughs> of uh, right. what what he saw as class inequality uh, within the church. He has a number of terrific essays about environmentalism yes. and the, and the saints' failure failure to live up to their duties in terms of uh, stewardship of of uh, creation. And so he was not afraid to uh, to, to point his pen uh, to, towards the current leadership and membership of the church as well, where he saw uh, us falling short of what he saw as the ideal of Zion, yes. uh, as outlined in the scriptures. Yeah, yeah. I was just thank you, Patrick. That's that's important. I'm just gonna my reflections on Hugh Nibley were number one. He he was at BYU when I was there. Just the incredible lore and respect. Just everyone viewed, there were all these fables about his memory and his intelligence and his time during the war and, and how he had a photographic memory and et cetera, et cetera. He, he was almost worshipped in a godlike way when I was at BYU. That, that's one memory I have. A second memory I have is, um, is, is like you said, Patrick, that, that he was it seemed like he spoke against war. It seemed like he spoke against bureaucracy, against uh, priestcraft, e even as it directed towards the church. M more importantly, when it came to his scholarship, on the one hand, Mormons viewed him as like a top-notch scholar. On the other hand, when I tried to read his scholarly work, it just felt like a wall of words, a wall of jargon. And I could never really make much sense of it as a BYU student. Um, uh, but then m my biggest disappointment with Hugh Nibley was when I, when I finally read No Man Knows My History and, and was really troubled by it. And then I read his pamphlet, No Man, That's Not History. It seemed like it didn't even deal with the merits of the core merits of Fawn Brody's book, but instead just wanted to kind of mock, mock her um, and and keep people from ever taking her work seriously. And, and in that sense, it was very disappointing because either I couldn't understand anything he was saying or he wasn't dealing with the credible issues and instead was sort of mocking. And I say that knowing that he in many ways is beloved and is a good-hearted person, I'm sure. Yeah. But that, yeah, that was just my impressions. Yeah. Of, you know, Go ahead. It, if I can just jump in quickly, just, uh, just a couple thoughts, you know, on, on the content of what Nibley said. Uh, uh, I think that uh, it's Nibley's place and the fact that he was there for so long in Mormonism was as important, if not more important than the specifics of what he said in any one essay. I think that there was a tendency in the Mormon world, you know, or at least people who are attentive to, uh, to scholarly issues uh, just saw Nibley as the person on the wall uh, who had the, the knowledge and background to be able to deal with the issues of the day, whether or not he was actually correct or made good arguments or was coherent, uh, I think in some cases was of lesser importance than the fact that he was there. And insofar as, you know, BYU students and, and other readers cared to go, right, he represented 
Uh, he was the bulwark right, it, against uh, the, the critics. Would it be unfair to just say it was almost like a, 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 corp, a, a, a humanized appeal to authority that you could basically say, well, I don't understand all this Egyptology stuff, but Hugh Nibley's super smart. He's got a PhD from Berkeley or wherever. And so if he still believes it, with as smart as he is, then, then I don't need to worry about the, that, that's the substance exactly, of these claims. That's exactly the phenomenon yeah. I, I was yeah. trying to express. Yeah, so he, be, he becomes a, a really important symbol, right? Yes. So on, on the one hand, more, there is an anti-intellectual strain in Mormonism, just as there is in American culture. Uh, uh, but on the other hand, there's also the appeal to authority. Right. And so uh, and, and we all do this. Right. Do I actually yep. understand the science of climate change? No, but right. I defer to the authority of, of experts. And so uh, Nibley represented that uh, with, within Mormonism. I'd say the other thing, the interesting thing about, about Nibley that I've come to appreciate more uh, as I've or, or come to recognize more is that how little influence he had outside of Mormon culture. Mm -hmm. uh, and so uh, now I would expect that if, if scholars are making really uh, persuasive arguments uh, uh, that are accessible to everybody and not accessible just based on uh, kind of internal truths and assumptions that, that those, would be, those arguments would be persuasive to other people of goodwill who are also looking at the evidence. And I, I think it's fair to say that, that even if we uh, even those of us who still have a kind of affection for Nibley and recognize his importance in Mormon intellectual history, I think we have to acknowledge uh, that he was not successful, particularly in persuading outsiders of his arguments. Yeah, I share that that affection and just want to, to you know, to amplify the point that, you know, his, his uh, influence in Mormonism is, is so strong that even where his scholarship uh, doesn't uh, measure up. Uh, uh, caution is taken in the way in which he's treated and displaced, right, in favor of new scholarship within the faith. And uh, I, I think that's been an important dynamic and, uh, and, and something we could talk a lot more about. Cool. Well, we are looking at a dwindling clock. So, Brian, can you take us from Nively quickly into the establishment of farms? Fair, and then the new Maxwell Institute uh, <laughs> within 10 minutes. Man, just, sure. a, just a brief overview because it's really the shift at the Maxwell Institute that probably sets, sets the biggest controversy right now. Apologies. Yes, well, just, uh, just uh, connecting with what we talked about earlier or early, uh, with regard to early, early 20th century archaeological uh, enthusiasm, right. I mean, the origins of farms, the foundation for ancient research and Mormon studies uh, began or, or was largely informed by uh, the enthusiasm on the part of uh, a handful of uh, uh, scholars and non-professional uh, uh, academics to uh, uh, try to establish the empirical evidence of the the historicity of the Book of Mormon. So that was an important part of the formation. It right in, in a way continues what Patrick referred to as that early 20th century uh, uh, effort and enthusiasm to try to find evidence for both uh, biblical narratives uh, and, and by extension, uh, Book of Mormon. There was also more textual work being done on the Book of Mormon and uh, Jack Welch, right? Obviously the, the, you know, the founding father of farms uh, he was doing textual work on the Book of Mormon, and uh, the, That's the chiasmus stuff, right? The chiasmus, yes, and and the enthusiasm and optimism of this group, right? They mobilized to form this foundation, which which uh, acted uh, independently of of the institutional LDS Church for many many years, and uh, sponsored uh, archaeological expeditions to Mesoamerica and other parts of Central and South America uh, to try to. Uh, uh, look for evidence uh, related to the Book of Mormon, uh, but also other kinds of uh, scholarship that they might, that they thought might be of, uh, of value in defending the faith. And uh, eventually uh, the uh, farm's effort was uh, uh, absorbed into Brigham Young University. Uh, it became uh, 
part of the uh, Maxwell Institute for Religious Scholarship, right? Where the Maxwell Institute is, has been an umbrella organization uh, and has gone through, you know, different iterations over the years. But, but, uh, but the work of farms was absorbed into that uh, institutional context. And one of the, the more important publications for the purposes of Mormon apologetics was the Farms Review of Books, uh, which became uh, the most well-recognized uh, apologetic source within Mormon scholarship for several years. And the Farms Review began uh, uh, under the, the leadership of Dan Peterson and, and Lou Midgley, uh, where it was... Uh, it, it was not only a review of publications and books, but really contained a variety of material, uh, a lot of which consisted of review essays, lengthy review essays yes. that uh, attempted to challenge criticisms of Mormonism or were taking on broader issues that could indirectly have implications for uh, uh, the truth of Christianity or the uh, the, the rationality of religious belief in general. And so you have this, this long tradition of publications that, uh, that were apologetics really in the, in the robust sense of the term uh, that were taking on critics of the faith. Uh, but, and this is an important point, I think, in the history of this whole enterprise uh, the, what we didn't see in that publication and, and, uh, in the Maxwell Institute more generally, was this kind of uh, reciprocal dialogical scholarship where the, the Farms Review was really right, an effort to broadcast <laughs> and with an audience uh, primarily of, of the Mormon faithful in mind, uh, in a way kind of playing to the home crowd in order to uh, uh, defend the church against what they perceived uh, Latter-day Saints could come across uh, as they uh, were reading the scholarship of the day. Can you can you speak to the tactics that that the the farms Peterson Midgley, uh, even Greg Smith and others are sort of in at least in some circles known for, just so the you know, whether or not it's fair even, but just to, to describe some of those tactics that, that we would, we will soon be referring to as kind of old style Mormon apologetics. Yeah. Well, it's a mixed bag. I think the, the, uh, the work that gets the most attention are the ones that were most provocative and controversial. Uh, but there definitely was, uh, I mean, going back to Hugh Nibley, there definitely was an adoption of that kind of, of acerbic uh, style uh, where uh, it was a combination of kind of, of playfulness and mean-spiritedness that we would see from time to time uh, in dealing with, with critics of Mormonism. And uh, at times uh, it could be uncharitable and uh, did not uh, do justice uh, to the other side of the argument. And that's one thing that I think... Uh, would, would you say that sometimes... Uh, uh, there was, uh, they engaged in ad hominem attacks. Do you think that's yeah, fair? I think that's part of it too, yeah. right? And I think we could, yeah, there. John, uh, do you have any, uh, <laughs> you have any experience with that, John? <laughs> well, I'm just one of many, you know. Um, but, but go ahead, Brian, what were you going to say? Well, I think that's definitely true. I think the ad hominem is another, you know, important part of it that, that it, it, it was a scholarly publication or has been a scholarly publication uh, in some respects and in other respects, it really falls outside the scope uh, of a serious scholarly publication because of some of the, uh, uh, some of the methodologies and tactics uh, that were used. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's sort, it, of, sort of like Fawn Brody was a lesbian or Simon Southerton is an adulterer or, you know, th th there, there have been some really mean-spirited and I would say even potentially unethical things that seem to be associated with that era. And then, and then just in addition, there's, there's a lot of information I've received that many of these people saw themselves as sort of um, auxiliaries or arms of the strength of the members committee where these same people would be gathering evidence 
against people to try and have their their status with the church kind of uh, you know put on trial, and so it went it went even a little far deeper than that to actually being almost like a CIA FBI sort of arm of the church to to try and take people out uh, with disciplinary councils. Is that is that something you've heard, or is that just rumor that I've heard? Well, I think in I think in some cases uh, there's evidence of that uh, in terms of the the published work, right? The public face of it all. I think that that you that you see that the that the publication uh, was attempting to uh, uh, anticipate uh, how the institu- institutional church would view one or another scholar. Right and attempted to you know, like be a, a kind of reconnaissance team, mm-hmm. right? In terms of engaging uh, them uh, outside of an explicit, uh, you know, institutional ecclesiastical context. Yeah. yeah. But and, the and fact kind of, that the organization was a was affiliated with BYU uh, made the issue more complicated than it would yeah. have been if it would have remained an independent foundation. Exactly. And, and and I think it's important to note that. Um, as as Brian said earlier, if, if the Farms Review was a mixed bag, and, and it's not like every essay was doing the kinds of things that we're talking about right now, uh, and much of it did participate in the long and venerated tradition of rational defense of, of the faith, mm-hmm. right? Um, that that didn't engage in ad hominem attacks, and and that was you know reasonable and fair and things like that. So so it was a it was a mixed bag, but I I, I just think we can't deny that there were some of these other tactics employed that that many of us, certainly myself, see as a, a somewhat less desirable and and yeah. uh, uh, falls outside the bounds of what what what, you, what one would expect at a university setting, even a religiously affiliated university, that it, where the mission is to um, promote the interests of the church. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Well, some of this is going to feed into the, the shakeup at, at farms, well, excuse me, at the Maxwell Institute and the repurposing of it. Uh, Brian, we still got to go quick. <laughs> yeah, what yeah. happened? What happened, Brian? What happened to farms and what happened well, to Maxwell Institute? To make a long story short, uh, Dan Peterson, the longtime editor of the Farms View, was uh, dismissed and uh, dismissed in a way that was rather messy. Uh, and do, we, do we know why he was dismissed or do we have a sense for it? Well, the, uh, the leadership of the Maxwell Institute has been uh, relatively silent on this question. So uh, we have to depend uh, to some degree on uh, the, the narratives of others. Uh, uh, Dan Peterson has been very public, right, and voluminous, I guess you could say, in his uh, retelling and retelling of, of the reasons why he was fired. Uh, and I don't want to speculate beyond uh, what we know, uh, but I, I think it's clear that Jerry Bradford, uh, the director of the Maxwell Institute had a different sensibility about right how this kind of scholarship could be done, and uh, and that that was percolating uh, before the uh, the the essay in question that uh, that had to do with you, John. Right, I think there was a difference uh, of opinion in terms of of direction. I think Jerry was trying to to look more toward uh, this uh, more traditional academic scholarly approach and and uh, uh, Dan believed that he was supporting the original mission of the Maxwell Institute and the charge that was given to the Institute from Elder Maxwell to vigorously defend the faith and you know that yeah. took a variety of forms uh, uh, so th- the most interesting part of the story I mean there are a lot of interesting components to it but perhaps in my at least in my mind the, the, the most interesting part is the conversation that took place after uh, Dan was dismissed in the way in which people were, you know, the kind of, the kinds of arguments that were mobilized either in defense of, of that change or, uh, or critics of the change who really believe that, that uh, BYU and by extension, you know, the church was really uh, selling out to, Right, secular scholarly studies in an inappropriate way. And I think that really characterizes much of what we're seeing today is yeah. uh, 
on the part of the, you know, the traditionalists, if you want to say the traditional apologists, right? They lament the fact that there has been a transformation of that particular publication, but also the, the, the Maxwell Institute in general, right? To a more, uh, to a more you know, kind of robust, serious, outwardly looking uh, body of scholarship, uh, as opposed to scholarship that would serve a kind of narrow purpose uh, for the church, but which included a kind of grab bag of all kinds of different, uh, you know, methodologies and ways of doing that. And awesome. so what, it, what happened is uh, pressure was brought to bear on Dan Peterson to actually change the name of the Farms Review of Books to the Mormon Studies Review, which he did, he says reluctantly. So the last issue of that publication under Dan Peterson was actually the first issue of the Mormon Studies Review. And then shortly thereafter, Dan was dismissed and Spencer Fluman, uh, a historian, was brought in uh, to be the new editor. And uh, under Spencer's leadership, uh, obviously the publication and now that he's director of the Maxwell Institute, right, that that organization is moving in a uh, in a different direction in some respects and and has maintained a lot of continuity in other respects regarding what it what it wants to do i don 't want to over dramatize the the right. changes, but certainly spencer 's sensibility lies more on the side right of traditional academic scholarship and a more outward facing mm -hmm. uh, uh, set of publications. He wants to engage the scholarly community uh, much more seriously and so when Spencer came in. Uh, he published uh, what came to be identified as the first issue of the Mormon Studies Review. So we really have, right, uh, two, first, two first issues yeah. of the Mormon yeah. Studies Review. But I think that's a, a symbol of the of what they represent, right? This this transition uh, from a more apologetic orientation to a more explicitly uh, uh, scholarly, and I say scholarly in the traditional mode of academic scholarship. And uh, that, I mean, we don't have much time, but there are just a, a fascinating set of questions having to do with, with uh, w whether or not the, the connection between Mormon studies and religious studies, right, ought to follow the traditional path of, of, of historical scholarship and the social sciences. I mean, I come from philosophy of religion and theology, as do you, Dan, and so... I'm really interested in questions of apologetics, even though I share the criticisms of, of that are brought to bear by my friends and colleagues, you know, across the Mormon studies spectrum. Yeah. In that particular case, yeah. uh, so I don't know how much of a of a good setup yeah. that was, or what. So you were if yeah. so so if the old farms in Maxwell Institute was trying to prove the church is true with archaeology or whatever, if it was a lot of sharp uh, attacks on critics and that homonym and kind of sharp elbowed type stuff. What is the content and tactic of Spencer Fluman's sort of era? How would you characterize the types of articles and the change in approach of what he's doing? Patrick. Sure. Well, I think the, uh, the Mormon studies review has totally changed direction. I, I think it's fair to say. So now it, what it does is it reviews, it does not publish any original scholarship. Uh, what it does, however, is publish review essays and then book reviews of books that uh, have to do with Mormonism, especially Mormon history. And the primary audience for the Mormon Studies Review is, not, is no longer internal. Uh, towards the, the faithful, sort of shoring up the, the foundations of faith for those inside the church. But the Mormon Studies Review is explicitly addressing an external scholarly audience. Essentially, the mission is, uh, let's, let's assume that uh, there's a scholar out there of American religion or religious studies who might be interested in, in Mormonism but doesn't know where to start, right? I mean, it's now a, a huge body of literature. The Mormon Studies Review is, is there as a tool for those scholars or other interested people in the public to come in and be able to, to see what is going on in the field of Mormon studies as it exists right now, 
and to have uh, to hear scholars discuss and review one another's works. So it's much more friendly, and I use that term advisedly because actually Spencer's first editorial in the first uh, volume was about friendship. And so he saw this as a much more ironic turn uh, for the Mormon Studies Review uh, as it sought to build bridges with outside scholars. And a lot of the authors in the Mormon Studies Review are non-LDS scholars. They oftentimes want people who are not experts on Mormonism to review some of these books to create bridges of understanding. But the Maxwell Institute also publishes other things like the Journal of Book of Mormon Studies. It continues to do things with ancient texts. So there are there are some continuities with the old farms, yeah. but yeah. certainly the style, the tone, the approach, and in many cases, the audience has shifted. Got yes. it. Got yeah, it. that's well said. There, there's an interesting continuity that, that has stood there, and that is that, you know, the Farms Review of Books, you know, presented itself as, right, reviewing the scholarship that was out there. And there's a sense in which the Mormon Studies Review, you know, uh, does not, as as uh, Patrick said, does not attempt to engage in kind of first order scholarship, but more in terms of kind of reflection and as a resource. So uh, the, the the Maxwell Institute can still continue to claim that they don't do Mormon studies, uh, right per se. Uh, so much as serve as a resource for scholars of Mormonism and create opportunities for dialogue. And Although the journal, the journal of Book of Mormon Studies does produce original scholarship. So, so I have a qu I have a question, Brian and Patrick. If if a critic wanted to sort of frame this change in the Maxwell Institute as sort of a, as sort of an admission that that the church kind of lost in, in the academic arena, that you really you really, uh, any attempts to prove the church is true or even support the veracity of the church's truth claims through academic or scientific means are pretty much uh, bankrupt. And so in some ways, the change is, is an admission to the fact that the church isn't on solid scientific ground. How would you guys respond to someone who wanted to frame it that way? Well, I'll... I'll uh... I would say that that would be an overdrawn conclusion to, to the changes within the Maxwell Institute. I think uh, it, this is a change of tactics much more than long-term strategy or an admission that somehow the entire project is, is bankrupt. Uh, I think it's a, it's a different tactical approach that values friendship, bridge building, a more ironic approach to scholarship. Uh, and maybe, uh, and, and I would say a, a greater humility in the sense, uh, there, there's a certain degree of uh, postmodernism, and I know that's a scary word and, and even kind of a messy word to, to use, but in the sense that in the 21st century, we... Uh, the, the academy is much less convinced of its ability to arrive at objective truth, uh, including uh, or maybe especially about uh, religious things. Uh, and so, so I think even uh, many Mormon scholars, even who are very committed to the faith, uh, agree that the tools of academic scholarship that have been developed in the modern academy are insufficient to prove the rational verity of Mormon truth claims. I mean, how, how do we have any tools to prove the existence of God? Um, the, the search to prove the historicity of the Book of Mormon has so far had, I think, at best mixed results. I mean, I think, uh, I think it's fair to say there have been some interesting archeological and textual uh, findings that, that do create some interesting correspondences that people can build on. But, but I think there's just a greater humility about what the tools of scholarship give us in terms of the ability to, uh, to lock down and objectively uh, verify the, the claims of Mormonism. And this is kind of what Lloyd, Lloyd Erickson's essay was about in the book. Is, yeah. is that right? Yes. Yeah. yeah I mean, Brian, yeah. Brian, would you, would you agree with what I just said? Or? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, just to connect it back to something I referred to way back, you know, where uh, in the debate among evangelical Christian uh, philosophers and apologists, Right, there's a big debate between uh, rationalistic approaches to apologetics 
and uh, uh, more uh, what you might call humble, postmodern, worldview-oriented apologetics, where uh, where the the objective is merely to present the Christian worldview in their case as uh, equally plausible uh, in the way in which it sees the world and presents facts and assembles the events of history, et cetera, uh, uh, versus uh, the people who, uh, who are more optimistic about uh, what reason and scientific discovery can give us. I think that's transferable in some respects to the Mormon context. I think we're moving more in the direction where, uh, you know, Mormon thought is, in general is moving more toward uh, a worldview approach where it wants to present a worldview and it wants to say that this is an equally valid or plausible worldview given the assumptions at work in Mormonism as a secular humanist worldview right. or a, an Islamic worldview. And, you know, that's more humble than what we've seen in the past on the part of a lot of, uh, of apologetic works, but it does mirror in many respects the, the development and the evolution of, of apologetic discourse in other faith communities. So I'm, yeah. I'm interested to see how this uh, humility, as Patrick referred to it, uh, develops and the ways in which it is taken up uh, in all kinds of ways in Mormonism, you know, given the, you know, not just in a scholarly context, but given the slowed growth rates of the church, you know, and the different way in ways in which uh, Mormon leadership and scholars are trying to to characterize Mormonism more as a, as a, uh, as more like a, the Jewish community, right? The, the light to the world and salt of the earth uh, rather than uh, a stone, you know, rolling, you know, to fill the whole earth. Yeah. Uh, yeah. To f that yeah. we fill the whole earth. Yeah. To use the Daniel thing. So there are all kinds of interesting ways in which Latter-day Saint discourse is evolving and changing given the demographics, right? Given, given Mormonism's uh, greater desire to have a place at the table uh, in a variety of contexts. I think we're seeing that uh, expressed in, in the way in which at least the institutional uh, side of Mormon scholarship is supported and uh, facilitated. And, yeah. and I think we should see all this on a spectrum. And, and I think it, um, we, sh we should be fair that, uh, at least in many of my conversations with what we can, the, the kind of old farms crowd, uh, that they would also admit that you can't argue somebody into faith, right? Um, that the rationalist defenses are, are there to, um, to, to shore up the faith, but that ultimately one apprehends the truth of the Book of Mormon or the truthfulness of Mormonism only through spiritual experience. So, so I, th I think we, we don't want to mischaracterize the other approach as purely rationalistic right. and objectivist, um, right. because it was, it was always uh, primarily based on uh, spiritual witness. Yeah. Right. So in the and case the of, the yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say in the case of, of Dan Peterson, right, Dan is very explicit about uh, the metaphors he uses, and he oftentimes will say that Mormonism uh, uh, leans more heavily on negative apologetics than it does uh, po positive apologetics. And, and one of the metaphors that I mentioned that he uses in, in his works is that of the buttress, right? Where the buttress isn't the building, but the buttress is there to support the building. And, and one of the points that I make in, in my essay is just from the standpoint, of, uh, you know, from philosophy of religion, is just trying to get at uh, what the role of evidence is, right? Is the evidence, right, uh, something that comes along after the fact, merely to support pre-existing presuppositions uh, and orientations and commitments, or can evidence really serve some kind of foundational role where people are really uh, arguing from the same body of evidence toward conclusions, and and one of the one of the challenges with with negative apologetics or with seeing apologetics merely as 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 being supportive is that that uh, that in a way could be said you know to undermine you know the entire uh, intellectual enterprise where uh, where argument and reasoning 
uh, serves as a kind of rhetorical secondary uh, role rather than, than a primary role. And that leads to some really interesting issues in just, you know, the relationship between faith and reason and presuppositionalism and evidentialism as it is called. And, and uh, uh, that's part of what I wanted to, I, I wanted to stir up some of the, some of the ground there to see uh, how that conversation would go as, as time goes on. Nice. So, and it was a great essay. And just let me do some stirring because we have about 23 minutes before we lose Patrick at least. And uh, that is to say that the first part of the book has Dan Peterson, it has Michael Lash, it's got Ralph Hancock, it has lots of people in it who are, you know, wanting to you know, talk about apologetics the way it's been. Then it has other folks who come along and are doing these things. You mentioned Lloyd Erickson's piece, John, and that's a terrific piece that's challenging the basic idea of, you know, what apologetics should do. We also have Joe Spencer there towards the end who has an interesting piece about trying to lay the ground for, uh, to actually get people to the, to the position where like you have to face the fact <laughs> that religion is not supposed to make sense. It's supposed to be this scandalous, you know, breaking in of God into the world, into your heart, et cetera, like that. And so he's, he's putting an apologetics in, in that. Mm -hmm. uh, hopefully that will be a new focus. So I just wanted to recommend that book from Coford uh, Press. So I'm going uh, I'm to yeah, show I'll it. I'll link to it in mine, and I'm sure you will too, John, in your write-ups. But Patrick, we're going to lose you. John, you a neo apologist and Patrick along with the Givenses and Adam Miller and the people you really wanted to talk to. And so we got Patrick right here for you to um, try out your sense of what's going on today and let's see how he feels. Okay. <laughs> I'll just add a shout out perspectives on Mormon <laughs> theology. Uh, Mark Kriegel wanted to make sure we gave a shout out to Lloyd Erickson and Blair Van Dyke yeah. for their job yeah. editing the book. Yeah. But, there's a lot and of cool stuff in the book. Because they just let the people speak. So if you want to hear Ralph Hancock and Dan Peterson with their normal tones and stuff, it's great. There's no attempt to, you know, quiet them down or anything like that. And then you get the, the counterbalance with the, you know, a studious Brian Birch. <laughs> well, and let me just say a word, you know, from an editorial standpoint, uh, you know, one of the things that, you know, uh, Lloyd and Blair and I and others are really interested in is letting voices speak for themselves. Yeah. Uh, and to uh, bring together those voices in a way where people are able to observe the landscape. They're not depending on someone else to tell them what the landscape looks like. They're able in a single volume to see it in action and to see these scholars yeah. responding to one another, not necessarily directly, right? Yeah. But, uh, you know, indirectly to our, if, you, if you're reading the volume cover to cover, I think you get a pretty good sense of, the landscape right now and what kinds of issues are yeah. in play.